tuned for an exciting announcement. At if you get rich enough and, and powerful enough, then uh, even if you get even if you become the mediator, you can at least lobby the government for legitimacy. Strange. We're very attached to the idea that things just keep getting better for every new generation. Like how before, there weren't any iPads. But now, we all have iPads. Fruit Ninja. Sadly, that steady march of progress narrative doesn't really hold up. Of course, a lot of things are better now than a few generations ago, don't get me wrong. However, the unfortunate reality is that there's a disturbing trend with work today. New jobs are declining in quality across a lot of different and incredibly important metrics. And you probably already know that. Odds are, your job sucks. But it's often hard to take that personal experience and put it in the context of a whole economy. Because whatever you're picturing, however horrible you're imagining the general state of work being, I guarantee what I'm about to talk about is a lot worse. There's a lot of different ways to measure job quality, but the most obvious one is money. Jobs don't pay as much anymore. I love For starters, Johnny pay has not kept up with productivity. We produce far more goods and services per hour than we used to, and up to the 70s, this increase in productivity tracked almost perfectly with an increase in hourly pay. More productivity equaled more money in the pockets of workers. Since then, however, productivity has gone up every year, by around 75% between then and now. But hourly wages have only risen a tiny 9%. So, where's the money gone? Unsurprisingly, most of the profit generated from that increase in productivity hasn't gone to workers. It's been captured by the 1%, whose wages have fully gone up an insane 138%. That's kind of abstract. Let me put it in more concrete terms. This inequality has cost what most Americans consider middle-class families $18,000 a year, 76 k instead of 94. But you're clever. You look at the graphs, and you see that even though inequality is some of the worst it's ever been, the line at the bottom is still going up. Even if just barely. But does that mean wages are rising? Not really. For the bottom 50% of the population, in other words, the average American, pre-tax, pre-benefits income has actually gone down by over 6% since 1980. And that's before you factor in the cost of living. That means things like inflation, which we'll get into later, but it also just means what kinds of expenses people are now responsible for that they didn't used to be. For example, since the 80s, employers have cut down on healthcare benefits. They've also made job training increasingly an individual responsibility. Student loan debt has only gotten bigger, the cost of not getting a college degree has only grown, and yet the benefits of having one are only going down. And this isn't just in education. People are needing to take on a lot more debt for just about everything. And I do mean need. Prices on essential goods way outpace wages year after year. So, just to get by, credit has become an essential part of a home budget. This is part of a larger trend within neoliberalism, where responsibility and cost for all sorts of things, like job training, healthcare, and retirement, are shifting increasingly onto the shoulders of individuals who are making less and therefore need to resort to debt to get by. Today, the average American has 90 grand worth of debt hanging over their head, and debt as a percentage of income has only gone up since the 50s. All this has another effect on work. Not only do we work for less, on average, we also work longer. Year over year, working hours in the US have actually remained relatively stagnant. But because wages have gone down in practical terms and personal expenses have gone up with the gutting of social services and costs borne by employers, we spend more of our lives at work. Over the past 30 years, the average age of retirement has gone up from 62 to 65. And last fall, Republicans actually started floating a plan to push retirement even later by delaying when people can receive full Social Security benefits and Medicare. I actually covered this topic about a year ago, but these kinds of policies actively target poorer Americans who rely on Social Security and are way more likely to die before reaching retirement age than their wealthier counterparts. Just so you get an idea of how prevalent this trend is, the same thing just happened in France as we were putting this video together. The country is on fire because, despite disapproval from the overwhelming majority of French people, the neoliberal president Macron raised the retirement age by going around the parliament. 
Like the Republicans did in the fall with their plan to make Americans work longer, Macron cited budget concerns and the upcoming insolvency of these retirement funds. But make no mistake, the reason retirement funds are going to be insolvent isn't because people aren't working hard enough, but because the wealth that they produce isn't going in their pockets or into funding these necessities. It's going to billionaires. But let's get back on track. None of these trends are helped, by the way, by another aspect of job quality that keeps declining. Security. More and more people are being brought into more precarious work on an intermittent, irregular, or contractual basis. The new name for it is quiet hiring. But for years now, companies like Uber and their gig economy clones have been selling it as flexibility. Jobs are less secure today than in the past. You are more easily fired. Protections for workers are less well enforced under contractor status. Unionization is either impossible or downright illegal. And neither pay nor benefits are nearly as good, with the latter rarely ever being provided. And it's not restricted to just one or two sectors of the economy. These jobs are everywhere. 53% of people between 18 and 34, and who work in the gig economy, do so as their primary income source. And according to a Princeton study, 94% of Insane. the net employment growth in the US between 2005 and 2015 has been in, quote, alternative work arrangements, meaning independent contractors, temp work, and freelancing are basically the only new jobs our economy is producing. The consequences are bleak. Unreliable work comes with a lot of insecurity. We know that capitalism regularly spirals into recession, around every five years at this point. So with the likelihood of a recession in 2023 seemingly really high, 80% of US workers, according to one study, is worried about losing their job. Regardless of the exact number today, this kind of anxiety about job security under neoliberal capitalism is always widespread. And it's another variable that makes work worse and makes wages stagnate. Workers are constantly worried about keeping their job, so they exercise wage restraint. They don't ask for a pay raise despite needing it because they're worried it could get them fired. This isn't helped by the fact that neoliberal politicians actively There's a 0% chance that you just said that like like what he's talking about is similar to what like artists that work on commission even before or after artificial intelligence art gains more prominence. Like, there's no way, right? Like, one could not make such a stupid comparison that uh, you're, you're not, <clears throat> there's no way you're still holding on to that grudge. Like saying, you know, you told artists to adapt and overcome and utilize AI as a tool in their tool belt. Why not tell the entirety of American working class to, to adapt and overcome? Brother, they're not getting fucking pushed out of the marketplace. They're not, they're not selling commissions on the side. Okay. This is their job. Their main job is turning the contracted shit. You can't make the same comparisons to literally fucking you selling drawings that you that you get commissions for. There's no point in history where like art has ever been people's like main fucking jobs in the same way that you would describe the rest of the fucking economy. I'm a Twitch streamer. I understand that, like, what I produce is not all that important in the, in the uh, grand scheme of things, okay? What? Artist is a job? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fucking selling commissions. I have defended artists time and time again. Obviously, obviously, art and the arts in general 
are tremendously important for societal development. I'm not a fucking stem lord. I'm not a stem cell. Oh, just stop us on. You know nothing about artist work. Yes, I know. You're right. I don't. I've never been an artist. I don't understand it. Uh, it's your struggle. Only you get it. You're going to keep living your fucking boho chic lifestyle funded and facilitated by other wealthy people or your wealthy parents, just like every fucking artist did permanently. I'm not talking about motherfuckers that are doing like graphic design or visual work for a company that are getting priced out. I'm talking about the comparison between AI art, okay? Uh, and and uh, artists who are selling uh, uh, their artwork as commissions or, or on a commission basis. Why are you acting like a douche, bro? Because it's so fucking frustrating to me that the service sector is like pretty much the only remaining sector for the American working class. Half of these guys who want to sell fucking artwork literally have to do the gig economy work not realizing that there's no comparison to make between the two because if their gig economy work was actually full-blown employment, they would have all the time in the world to make all the fucking paintings that they want to. Anyway, automate more shit. It'll only make me grind harder. Adapt and overcome and be applied to what needed to do for capitalism too. We need to be willing to use the tools of our enemies, oppressors against them to overthrow them. But like when I say artists need to uh, figure out a way to utilize AI art in it because it's an inevitability, okay, uh, is, is not like me saying sucks to suck. It's me saying like be smart about it. If you don't figure out a way to fucking utilize it, then you're going to get cut out. You're going to get cut out and shut out from the marketplace. And there's not really any kind of like real restriction you can place on that because it's technological achievement. It's like, again, it's like the guy who was working on candle waxes his entire fucking lives, uh, his entire life while simultaneously, you know, the light bulb is being invented. It is a foreseeable and, and oftentimes very shitty byproduct of exponential growth and, and the exponential growth of technology. Like, there are so many different ways that an AI can serve you at the top of the hour ad break. Okay? And I know that. The AI will eventually replace me. They will serve you creative ways. Uh, they will serve you in, the, in way more, significantly more creative ways at the top of the hour ad break, which comes at the top of every hour. Will they tell you that you can avoid those ads by subscribing for $5 or for free? Yes, they will probably tell you that too. Will they tell you that there are other methods that you can use? Most likely not. They won't even, you know... Make references to it. So, hey, Bozo, thank you for the five gifted subs. Joey Taco Penis, thank you for the five gifted subs. Just a three-minute ad break now. Let's get back to the fucking video. I'm getting derailed for no goddamn reason. I actually uh, wanted to get derailed so I could serve at the top of the hour. Ad break. Ariel Khaleesi, thank you for the ten gifted subs. Promote this wage restraint behavior by lying to people about the relationship between wages and inflation. In case you're wondering, by the way, wages and inflation aren't related. The wage price spiral is BS. You can get a raise without making inflation worse. Here's a study on that. I think I forgot to print that one. Okay, here we go. Uh, proof is on the bottom of page five, top of page six. We got too many printouts here, let's move on. Look, if that wasn't enough, kids aren't being spared from declining job quality either. Child labor laws are starting to come down all across the country. According to the Economic Policy Institute, 10 states are introducing or have Fire. already passed legislation weakening child labor laws, despite the fact that violations of child labor protections are actually on the rise. Saying it like that is a little vague. Let me read you some details off the list of these bills. Thoughts on this guy being a tanky? I, I, I hope he fucking drives a tank to your house, okay? That's my thoughts on this guy being a tanky. Take a fucking week off and think about how stupid you are as a human being. In Arkansas, a bill was passed that eliminates age verification and parent guardian permission requirements. In Iowa and Minnesota, bills were introduced to lift restrictions on hazardous work. And in all these states, bills were introduced or enacted that extended working hours for minors. 
And I know that right now you're probably thinking of kids in their late teens working the register or in fast food kitchens. Jobs that are grueling but often get depicted as easy. Those aren't the only jobs kids are doing right now, and they're a lot younger than what you're picturing. For example, in their report, the EPI mentions violations happening in meatpacking facilities, where over 100 kids between 13 and 17 are working illegal overnight shifts, handling dangerous chemicals, and quote, cleaning razor-sharp saws and other high-risk equipment on slaughterhouse kill floors. It's giving the 21st century a real cool retro 1900. Okay, what JT doesn't understand <clears throat> is that one, the children yearn for the mines, they all play Minecraft, and two, their tiny fingers are so much better um, as it pertains to cleaning like the tiny holes in those uh, massive saws. So, uh, sorry. It's kind of a good thing, okay? And lastly, they're learning very important job skills. Vibe. But it gets even worse in agriculture, where 33 kids are injured every day in the U.S. because so long as they have parental authorization, 14-year-olds get to use machetes and work with dangerous pesticides for unlimited hours with barely any sort of safety regulations in place. Oftentimes, by the way, making less than minimum wage. How fun is that? Speaking of demanding work, let's turn back to France for a second, because they actually measure the intensification of work over there. Back in the 80s, around 12% of French salaried workers had a physically strenuous job. Now, 40 years later, with all the developments we've made in automation that should make work easier, that number's gone up to 34%. And it's not just physical strain. Over the same time period, the number of salaried workers with a mentally strenuous job went up from 6 to 35. You wanna know why? You wanna know why? Service sector jobs, baby, and delivery jobs. It's not like their fucking constructions uh, tremendously increased, okay? No. It's because when automation creates opportunity to lift the workload of the working class under a capitalist organization of the economy, the benefits are only given to the owners of corporations. What do I mean by this? Talk about it all the time. I'll give you a like a super old school example. Let's say you're you don't have a plow, right? You have to fucking plow with your hands. Get on your hands and knees, okay? All of a sudden, or let's say you're using a plow, all of a sudden a tractor comes in. That's efficiency. That's technological improvement, right? Now, before you needed you needed like, let's say you need eight, pe eight people on the plow carrying all this shit, right? But now you have a tractor. Well, guess what? The tractor will, in normal circumstances, allow you to do less work. Holy shit, we have a tractor. How wonderful. All eight of us can now keep our job, literally increase our output, uh, you know, plow more farmland, and be able to work even less hours and it be less strenuous. What happened, however, because the farm is not owned by you, but owned by your boss, somebody else, your boss said, well, you have a tractor now. You, as one farmer, can do the job of eight. So now you find yourself doing eight other farmers' work with the one tractor. Your output has increased as a singular individual, but your salary hasn't. What I'm describing to you is at the heart of what JT is talking about in this video. Productivity increases, your output as a singular worker increases when you have the advent of technology like uh, the internet becomes commonplace, computers get better, mobile phones get better, you're on 24-7, you're, you're having fucking uh, business emails that you have to respond to after work. All of this stuff is making you a significantly more productive worker. And therefore, your output is higher in comparison to someone in the 80s or someone in the 90s doing the exact same job that you are engaging in. But what happened? Did the average hour that you spend in the workplace decrease? No. As a matter of fact, in certain respects, it might have even increased. It didn't decrease, it increased. Why? Because 
They fired all the other workers because they can make you do the job of eight. So what do those eight other workers do? Well, they have to get a job or else they die. They move to different sectors. That's why the most viable economies or the most viable sectors for uh, irregular working class people in the United States of America or even in France, you know, comparable OECD nations, Western neoliberal nations, the most viable industries are service sector jobs where you can go and become a delivery driver. You can go and, uh, or you can go and, and uh, work at uh, a, a retail job. You can go and work at a restaurant. These are really difficult jobs. They're very strenuous jobs. So when, that's the reason why in France, over the course of the time frame that they were looking at, the amount of physically tasking jobs has increased. The percentage of physically tasking jobs have increased. Because technological achievements do not work in favor of the working class under a capitalist organization of the economy. Your bosses will utilize that to their advantage to make sure that the profit margins are higher than before. Okay? 5%. If we can assume that these numbers are relatively generalizable to a similarly developed country like the US, more Americans, contrary to the popular narrative, have harder, not easier jobs. By and large, the increase in productivity, the leaner operations, and the more efficient pace of work that came with advanced technology mean a lot more intensive a turnaround for workers today than at any other point in history. But let's give up the national lens for a second. A lot of the idea that work keeps improving probably comes from the fact that the US has moved from a manufacturing and manual labor economy to a service economy. Jobs that are widely and unfairly considered easy. But let's for the sake of argument say they are easier. Just because Americans aren't in factories as much as before doesn't mean those jobs have disappeared. Work hasn't gotten better. All that's happened is that these factory jobs have been thrown onto other people's backs who just happen to live in other countries. We didn't transition to a service economy by eliminating factory labor, but by having wealthy countries force open foreign markets to American and European capital so that they could be the ones to take on this burden. Because when companies move their manufacturing overseas, it's usually to take advantage of lower wages and less stringent safety requirements. Once again, worsening job quality. What most of these trends find in common is the shift in the balance of power away from workers and towards capitalists, the owners of businesses. The more power capitalists have, the more they're able to extract profit from workers by any means. Hence, jobs get worse. As evidence of this shift, just look at unionization. It's not Dijon mustard chatter, I'm actually currently using tahini. Trends. Since around the 60s, unionization has gone way down, and in perfect mirror image, the share of income held by the top 10% has gone up. But this growth of capitalist power isn't limited to unionization. Capitalists in the neoliberal era have helped to elect politicians that weaken workers in every imaginable way. Politicians that strip away social safety nets, like Reagan and Clinton, that weaken bargaining power and defund the NLRB, like Trump, that force open foreign countries' borders to American companies, like what's happened in East Asia and Latin America, all of these things contribute to creating a more vulnerable, less powerful workforce that can be taken advantage of more easily, that is more likely to be unemployed or underemployed, that year after year has to contend with more and more obstacles to living a comfortable life. Through these combined efforts, capitalists are able to wield more power in negotiations with workers, push wages down, strip their access to healthcare, union bust indiscriminately, and personally accumulate wealth at levels we haven't seen in all of human history. And none of this is to romanticize the 50s or some bygone era, by the way. Those were not good times for anyone not like this. Trying to turn back the clock isn't going to solve any of these problems. The seeds of declining job quality were already there back then. You recreate a New Deal social democracy in the US today, and within a couple years it'll melt back into neoliberalism because it isn't a solution that takes away capitalist power, nor their need to make profits at all costs. The balance of power True. of the 50s was nothing more than a temporary compromise that only held while capitalists were satisfied. 
Bottom line is, we're not going to find a solution in some mythologized past. This is why you experience quality of life decreases not only in the United States of America, but also in European social democracies. That's right. That's why it's happening. Because when there is uh, a, a nationalized program or there are social safety nets that could be privatized or diminished, capitalists will absolutely eviscerate it slowly but surely no matter how powerful and how popular they are. And what you're seeing in Europe and what you're seeing in Canada as well is exactly that. They need to find new profit sectors or new profit vectors in the form of new sectors that could be privatized. So what do they do? They underfund socialized entities dramatically. Then they point to how fucking underperforming those entities are, like public education, like social health care, like socialized medicine in Canada. They point to how bad that is. And then they go, we need to bring in private medicine. That's how this works. Same thing is happening in the NHS. How, how many years of, of Tory austerity has the NHS had to withstand? You think that shit sucks for no reason? That's the reason. So remember that. Social democracies also will inevitably wither away because it does not eradicate capitalism. It's only going to be when people have actual collective autonomy to make economic decisions and aren't forced to generate profits for a small group of wealthy businessmen that work can actually and durably improve. If you only take one thing away from this video, let it be this. Your job will never truly improve under capitalism. So long as the profit motive is the guiding principle of every business, safety, working conditions, and basic human dignity will always be an afterthought. If we want to get to a place where we can take pride in our work, enjoy a good work-life balance, and use new technology for the benefit of all workers, capitalism needs to go. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that I had an exciting announcement. As of today, both the Deep Program and First Thought will be available on Nebula. I've gotten a lot of requests to host them both on the platform, so I hope- Congratulations to JT. I'm sorry, but the whole reform or revolution thing is so stupid. I think these options are both tools that can be used to fit the according to conditions. We aren't in Tsarist Russia. What are you- who are you talking to, bro? Like who who are you talking to? So what's the option to sit here and rotting in neoliberal hell uh, and reject social democracy? There's no mythical rising up of workers. The conditions don't call for it. Yeah, I know, but I don't think I don't think JT is is has ever fucking advocated for like immediate revolution. So I don't know where you got that fucking idea from. And I certainly am not saying that. I don't believe that <clears throat> I do not believe that America's labor aristocracy or the Western world's labor aristocracy